I would like to invite you to turn you to the book of Daniel, <clears throat> chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Let's start at verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, to his hand <clears throat> with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Verse 3. And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his units, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the provinces. Verse 4. Children in whom no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom, cunningly knowledge and understanding science, such as the ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Verse 6, now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuch gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah Abednego. You may be seated. I'm going to go ahead and read verse 8 to 10. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might defile himself, might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the princes of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has pointed your meat and your drink. Or why should he see your faces worse lacking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Praise the Lord. God bless you. The Lord will just help us for a few minutes. Uh, it's a sermon I preached on before, and it just kind of come back in my heart. And I want to title this Children. Children in Babylon. Children in Babylon. You know, it's amazing sometimes when you read the book of Daniel, when you're thinking about Daniel, you think about an old man. Daniel, the wise, old Daniel. It, your mind kind of goes there. But actually we find here in the scripture that Daniel knew his children when they first went there. They were not men, they were children. And we see here, uh, the prophet of God says in the message, Gabriel instructions to Daniel, and I just want y'all to just listen to this. He says, I want you to notice how Daniel, yet an alien, yet oosted from his people, oosted from his church, without one church service, without any church to go to, without any hymns to be sang, but what he's saying himself. In the midst of all of this, still hold on to what the prophet said. Amen. So now you see Daniel, which he's, as you read on down in this quote, he began to talk about how Daniel knew was probably around the age, I believe, 12 and 14. Now think about that. How many 12 year olds we got here? 12, 11, 13, 14, 
15. 16. 17. 18. It's good for you anyway. But one thing about it for certain, we can go back and think about the times when we was that age. Amen. So, I want to just try to paint a picture and pray that it'll help you. But one thing I want you to know, you are those special children. Like it was in Daniel times, you are now those special children. You have to understand the context of the scripture. When they brought Daniel and them to captivity, they wasn't looking for all of the children of children of Israel. It was certain ones that they was looking for. Certain ones. That's the only thing on their mind. Ones that got, got wisdom, skill, understanding. Those are the ones we want. But what was the purpose for? To use the gift that God already given them, but they wanted to domesticate them to Babylonian thinking so that they can teach the Babylonians. So in other words, they want to take what God already let them be born with, take it and pervert it for the use of Babylon. The devil is no different today. He want to take the gifts in your lives. Young people in this message, he want to take it. He want to get you to fall so he can take them gifts and go use them for his purpose. And Babylon, which represents the world. Can we say amen? amen? Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. You are special children. That don't mean you get special treatment. You are special children, but you get the same treatment as anybody else because the word corrects us all. But I'm just trying to help by the help of the Holy Spirit to show you what, what you are in God's sight. The devil is not interested in uh, denomination. It don't matter to him. He already got them. They belong to him according to the scripture the, of the mother of harlots. When she got harlots, he owns all of that. But it's this message what the devil is attacking. Amen. Praise the Lord. He don't attack the Baptists and the Methodists. No, it's the message. Believers is what he attacks because he wants you. Amen. See, what well, you have to understand, uh, yeah, all children in the world, yeah, all of them got, the devil attacks everybody, but he got a special taste for you. A special taste because he wants to uh, use you to build his kingdom for his glory, that's what the devil wants. But I'm so thankful that God got fivefold ministry today that's going to keep standing right on the forefront, letting young people know you can live this gospel. Amen. You can overcome this world. And you, can't, you don't have to walk around being beat down by the devil. You can be free. This message is about freedom. It's not about bondage. If you look at the message as do's and don'ts, you'll never get nowhere. This message is life. This, can anybody show me one quote, one scripture, where God wants you to be in bondage? Just one. Where he wants you to be in bondage. You won't find it. Because God don't want you to be in bondage. This message comes to set you free. Now, people want to keep you in bondage. The devil want to keep you in bondage. But God wants you to be free. Now, in this story here, we're going to have to go a little background to, to, to try to work it up with children in Babylon. We find out in verse 1, the children of Israel is going into captivity because they rejected the prophet Jeremiah. God kept warning them over and over and over uh, not to do certain things, but they wouldn't listen to Jeremiah. And then eventually, winded, they ended up down there in bondage. Can we say Amen. See, rejecting the word was what put you in bondage. You see, a lot of times if we ain't careful, we're going to say reject the prophet put you in bondage. No, that's incorrect. Rejecting the word put you in bondage. Because God makes it very plain, even with Samuel. He said, Samuel, they didn't reject you. They have rejected me. Can we say amen? You see, brothers and sisters, I love this message with all of my heart. I live and die for it. I, re I really do, because it's the truth. But I do want to explain something to you. 
you definitely got to have a balance in your life what a messenger is and who God is. I'm not here to try to prove to you Brother Branham was a prophet. That's not my ministry to prove to you Brother Branham is a prophet. That's something that had to be revealed to you by God. Can we say amen? You know, I find amongst young people, they actually get mad at Brother Branham and don't even understand why they're mad at him. That's right. He said, oh, not me. All right, I'll give you the symptoms of people that don't got mad at a prophet. When you, you ask somebody a question, then they give you the answer, and then you say, did Brother Branham say that, or is that in the Bible? That's the proof you got an attitude against a prophet. See, what doesn't happen in your thinking, as you grow up in the message, you hear Brother Branham say it, Brother Branham say it, Brother Branham say it, Brother Branham say it, Brother Branham say it. You hear it all the time. So now you want to judge everything. Well, did he say it or did the Bible? I'm just going to tell you something, friends. On my stand as a minister, when I say the prophet said, oh, I say Brother Branham said, only thing I'm saying, this is what God said through his prophet. That's what I'm saying. But you got some ministers, is this a lie? Well, they hear it, they hear it. I stand, on, I stand on what I say. But you got some ministers can't preach without saying, We're here to lead you to Jesus Christ, not to Brother Branham. Brother Branham is God's ordained messenger. Can we say amen? But he led us to worship God. Huh? He's a type of Eliezer. Eliezer, when he got Isaac a bride, God sent a prophet to go get him a bride. Then you know what? How many of you believe that uh, Eliezer and Rebecca, I mean, Isaac and Rebecca appreciated Eliezer? How many of you believe that? I wonder why they didn't name one of their children Eliezer. But yet they appreciated him so much. I know people name their children William Branham. Because you name your child William Branham, that don't mean your child going to heaven. But this message is true. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, if you got any questions about the message, the best way to get your answer is keep the right spirit. Because we're in a time now, people ask you questions hoping you can't answer them. If somebody asks you a question with a wrong spirit, you can't give them an answer. Because they're approaching you the wrong way. But if you got the right spirit, the answer is there. I promise you that. Can we say praise the Lord? So what's happening today, we see that here in the Bible... Oh, I know some going to call me. Oh, what are you against the prophet? Have I said anything against Brother Branham? No. But the way mine's been programmed now, see, because so many people leaving the message now, everybody walking on eggshells. <laughs> don't say nothing about the prophet. That's nonsense. Because people that are mature and balanced in their life, they have a balance. They know what's being said and they know what to say and what not, what not to say. Can we say praise the Lord? If Brother Brandon was sitting right there in that chair, I'd say the same thing. And I believe Brother Brandon would say amen. Because he led us to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, young people. There's three types of people around this message. There's a group of people that have made Brother Branham more than what he was. There's a group of people who have taken away what he was. But there's a bride know exactly what he was. The ones that makes him more than what he was, that's when all these strange doctrines come from. Deity doctrines and all these things. And then the ones that take away from where he was, they always want to find and preach his mistakes. His faults and his errors. But the bride say, Elijah, a man of light, precious passions. Knowing he was a man just like you and I. 
Brother Branham is the, is the most humblest man that I know to have such a prophetic ministry, but will get up in the pulpit and admit when he says something wrong. Now, how many of you got to do that? But he did it. He would admit I was wrong. To me, that's the spirit of Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. But I encourage every one of you, lay in this message. Yes, Dig in it. Pray. Just lay in it. Amen. Amen. How do you know what a preacher telling you the truth if you ain't studying it? You have, this message is designed, you have to study it yourself. Not just when you come to church and hear the pastor preach. You yourself got to be at home, dedicate yourself. I mean, and, and, and discipline yourself to study this message. It's exactly right. Mom and daddy can't give it to you. You got to get it yourself. The Bible says seek your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. Just the way it has to be. But I'm going to tell you, this is the greatest. This message is not a move. It's a restoration. <laughs> to take us back to what the original is. Can we say praise the Lord? To show us that we are sons and daughters of God, not bound by any man's thoughts or any man's creeds or doctrine. We're supposed to be set free. Amen. I love it. When I can see young people grab a hope of a true revelation, get a true experience in their life, and take this message and get, get, go with it. I love it. It goes to prove that you don't have to be old to be in the message. You don't have to wait till you get old to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You can be six years old, five years old. You can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Some people say, well, I've been trying to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It just ain't happening. It just ain't happening. I'm going to tell you why it's not happening. Because you're not ready to die. Right. The more hungry you for it, the quicker you'll get it. Right. When you're ready to die from your thoughts and your way, say, God, I want you. I got to have you. I'm going to die. You're ready for it then. Yes, but you're going to say, well, I guess I'll try to get it. Forget it, it ain't gonna happen. You gotta want it. Thirsty for it. Hungry for it. If you don't have it, you gotta want it. Amen. And if that thirst is there, it's simply because it's God pulling you. The prophet of God said, Why do you hunger? Why do you thirst? He said, It is the Holy Spirit pulling you. But the devil got so many things out there trying to get you to quench your thirst. With worldism, things of this world, and friends and stuff like that. Them the things you got to get away from you. Because I'm going to tell you right now, when God calls you, the first thing he calls you for is separation. Total separation from all unbelief. Because what God does when he first calls you, he want to separate you to himself so he can strengthen you. Get you where he wants you to be, then he'll send you back. He'll send you back to go to people that, are, that you didn't care for and that got on your nerve was a bad influence on you. When God strengthened you, he'll send you back to them because now they can't no longer influence you, but now you can influence them. That's exactly right. But you yourself need to be strengthened. I'm sure that we're on different stages in here, some born again, some may not be born again. Some uh, in different transitions in life. I, I'm, I'm aware of all of those things. I'm speaking in general. So whatever category fits you, you just take that and say, thank you, Lord. Amen. But I'm so interested here. When the children of Israel, they carried down uh, from Babylon, I mean from Jerusalem to Babylon, Jeremiah told them year after year this is what's going to happen to them. And as far as they know, yeah, yeah, yeah. There go that Jeremiah again prophesying and yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, finally, that day came. Nebuchadnezzar and his crew coming down to Jerusalem, just wrecking the place. I want you to think about this. Uh, just a little drama. Daniel, him in the house, all of a sudden, uh, they hear it, they see a Dust storms. Because you know in the Bible when an army moves, it's just like a bunch of sand. So they know it's an army coming. And all of a sudden they hear rumbling. And Daniel looking around, what, 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 what's going on? He goes, no, he's out, just to put it like that. Daniel outside playing. He see this dust storm coming up. He said, what's going on? Then he runs in the house, mama, daddy, something, something is not right. And mama and daddy looks out saying, 
Huh. This is what Jeremiah is talking about. Come, come on in the house, Dave. Come on now. Dave, what's going on, mama? Just, just come into the house. Come into the house. And now just think of all of that screaming taking place. People being taken out of their house, taken out of their homes, and nothing they can do. You go read the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, God let the children of Israel know that when the enemy comes, don't even try to fight them because your weapons won't work. Go back and read Jeremiah. I think it's Jeremiah 8. He said, God said, they ain't going to do you no good. He said, your armory ain't even going to work. Because God controls those things. He let them know it ain't going to work for you because I tried to fight for you. I tried to keep you in the right path. But you are the one that rejected my word. Now you got to answer for it. So don't even try to fight. How many of you don't read the book of Jeremiah? I'm going to tell you one, one amazing scripture in the book of Jeremiah when you get up to, I can't remember what chapter it is, when Dan, Jeremiah was in jail He's, and they was in captivity, Jeremiah sent a letter to them. And that letter that he sent to them, they was no doubt, they was already in captivity wanting comfort. Wanting to be comforted. But then Jeremiah sent a letter. I can see the children of Israel. Ooh, Jeremiah sent a letter. Ooh, he's going to let us know it won't be long. We're going to be getting out of here. But God said 70 years, he ain't going to change. But in the condition that they was in, in bondage, when he sent them the letter, when they began to read it, the letter says, build houses. Plant vineyards. Have children. Build houses, plant. We in, we in Babylon. But God said, no, that's what I want you to do. And then after all of that, then pray for the ones that got you in captivity. It don't sound like no encouragement is in that. But that was the letter of encouragement because God said you're so depressed now to where you're going to walk around, don't want to do nothing, and just don't, don't want to do nothing. He said, you, he said, if you do that, then when 70 years is up, I ain't going to have nobody to bring out of there. Amen. He said, so keep going. He said, if you want peace, get along with them. Pray for them. He said, but I'm giving you an expected end that you won't be there him all way. I'm going to pull you out, but you got to keep going on. You see, when you're going through something in life as a young person getting depressed, the first thing you want to do is sleep it away. Sleep, 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 sleep. Oh, 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 sleep. You know what? When you got problems and you go to sleep and when you wake up, you know who's looking at you when you wake up? That same problem you went to sleep with. God has not called us to run from things. He called us to deal with it. Overcome it. Can we say praise the Lord? You can, you can overcome any situation by the help of God. You can overcome any situation in your life. I don't care what it is. You can overcome because we've been ordained to overcome. Like we were saying earlier, you go read the book of Revelation, to him that overcome. Each age said to him that overcome. That is a prophecy to let you know it will be overcomers in every age. And as dark as this age is, it's going to be overcomers. Can we say praise the, Lord? praise the Lord? But if you notice in verse 2, it says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. See, they took the vessels of the house of God and they took the people of the house. They took everything. But look what the devil intent is, is to put them in the house of his God. So that's why the devil want to get God vessels which is you, which is me. He want to get us and use us for his service. And God permitted to be so because they rejected the word. Are you with me? Verse 3. And the, then the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his units, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, of the king's seed, and of the princes. If you notice how that read, it said certain of the children of Israel, not just any of them, certain of them, but which ones did he want? Of the king seed. That comes down from David's bloodline because the devil said, this is payback. David don't gave me all kind of trouble. 
He done killed my Goliath. He done beat all my Philistines. He said, David is gone, but now I got David's seed line. Now I want to get them. That's the one he wanted was David's seed line. And that's what the devil wants today. He wants the bride of Jesus Christ. He wants you, but I'm here to let the devil know he can't have you. Because you belong to God, not the devil, not this world. You belong to God. And he says, verse 4, children, of whom was no blemish. Why children? He want to get children with an innocent mind. That he can get them away from their parents. Get them to himself so he can put in their mind what he wants in this mind, in their mind. This is the same tactic that they done in the days of Egypt. Trying to kill the male child. Same thing happened in the New Testament. Trying to find the seed, killing the children. And the devil is doing the same thing today, trying to get the younger generation to influence them into wrong, knowing that they can influence the next generation come behind them. But the devil, he don't realize it's a prophecy made over the bride. God's going to have old people, young people, children. They're going to overcome this age. That's right. Notice children in whom no blemish, but well favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning, and knowledge and understanding sign. Some of the smartest people I know in this world is children in this message. Very smart, very intelligent. And the devil wants you. He wants to use you for his glory. That's what the devil wants. All right, let's keep going. Verse 5. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. And of the wine he drank. So nourishing them three years that at the end there they might stand before the king. Let me backtrack just a little bit before we go farther with this. Now here is Daniel. His family, families being moved all the way to Babylon. They get settled in their houses. Because, you know, they gave them houses and all that stuff. But think about it. When they get settled in, their bodies are settled in, but their spirit is not because that's not where they belong. They belong in Jerusalem. But now they don't get settled into their homes. Everybody's sitting in the house wondering what's going to happen, what's going to go on now. And then all of a sudden, Daniel's parents hear that there's a decree has been made to go select certain Children. You see how smart that devil is? He wants the seed, the king's seed, certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed. Special picks. I'm going to tell you, you are the devil's picks because he wants you bad. But you have to see that. You have to do the same thing Daniel did. You're going to have to purpose something in your heart. I'm not going to defile myself. With that purpose comes power. I'm going to show you that in a moment. Now, here go Daniel and them in their homes. They don't got settled in. I can see Daniel's parents just walking around. Knock comes to the door. Y'all, I'm dramatizing. They open the door as one of the king's servants. So there's a decree being made. We're looking for certain children. And we come to get them, and we'll be back at a certain, certain time. I can see Darren, Daniel's parents, the door shut. They're reading the decree, and they're whispering and talking to each other. It's coming for our child. That's what they're coming for. And uh, I can see Daniel back in the back. How many of you children, you know how that goes when your parents whisper you don't like it? They're talking about me. What are y'all whispering? His parents whispering. Daniel look around. Mom, what, what's going on? Just go, go back, go back, just go back, Daniel. And then they're reading it. They're reading it. Oh, man. Daniel, what? What is it? Just go in your room, Daniel. And mom and daddy, they start talking amongst these sons. They say, you know they're coming to get Daniel. They say, honey, I, I, know, I know that. They said, and you know there's nothing we can do to stop it. Because we rejected the prophet. We rejected the word. That's why we're in this condition. So now there's nothing we can do. 
He's now going to have to be at the mercy of God just like we are. A day or two passed by. Parents walking around, sweating, crying. And they know the guy's on the way. And they called Daniel. They said, Daniel? Said, yes, mama. Yes, daddy. Come here, son. And Daniel said, what? Why y'all got that look on your face? That this son or something I got to tell you. And ain't nothing I can do about it, Daniel, but something I have to tell you. He said, Daddy, what is it? He said, Daniel, it won't be much longer now. Someone's going to come and get you. And they're going to take you away from here and to that king's palace. And they said, but I don't want to go. He said, Daniel, there's nothing I can do. It's going to happen, Daniel. And Daniel said, but Daddy, why? Why? He said, Daddy, Daniel, we rejected the word. We did it. Now it's, it's, it's going to fall on you because we as parents rejected the word. Now it's falling on you. We're sorry, Daniel, but there's nothing we can do. And then all of a sudden they hear the horses coming. Open the door and there goes Daniel. Got his bag packed. And Daniel walking out with his head down because there's nothing he can do. And then his dad said, Daniel, he whispers in Daniel's ear, it's what his father He's going to stick something in your pocket. I want you to keep it. He stick a scroll of Jeremiah. He stick a scroll of the book of Jeremiah in Daniel's pocket. (laughs) Because you're going to find out that's what Daniel had. And that's what kept him all those years in Babylon. But his daddy gave him the quote book as a child. I could see Daniel walking out, selected by the king. See, in the carnal mind, being selected by the king is an honor. You think about some of them Israelites standing there. They seeing Daniel being chosen. Damn, why you sad, bro? They chose you, man. You're going into the king's palace. The Daniel just walking with his head hanging down. Why you sad, Daniel? And then the other one that wasn't chosen. I sure would like to go into the king's palace. You see, a lot of times when you think the world got something better to offer you, you think that's an honor. That's not an honor, that's death. But the devil want to let you see you've been promoted. Promoted. This is good for you. That's what the devil wants you to look at and see. But in Daniel's case, he said, no. I don't want to go there. But as Daniel walking there with that quote book in his pocket, heading up to Babylon to the king palace, I can see those old Babylonian girls just looking at Daniel. What's your name? (laughs) You're cute. You're handsome. And old Daniel walking, heading to the palace. They're talking to her. And then when, when Daniel look at them, he began to smile. Then that quote book, his his hand go back, hit that quote book, and just turn his head. No, 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 no. (laughs) They're just smiling, flashing those eyes in. 14 years old, the pressure. Girls coming after. The pressure, boys coming after. I'm going to tell you something, friends. Whenever you really want to serve God from the depths of your heart, that boy that you tried to like all your life that never paid you no attention, as soon as you start, you want to serve God, he starts liking you. Why do you think that's so? That's the devil to get you trapped. Then this girl didn't pay you no attention, the beauty queen of the school. Now all of a sudden she looks at you and you go like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let me go home and take a shower. <laughs> Never paid you no attention. But now giving you all that attention, that is a distraction. Satan just start putting things in your life because you see now you're trying to quench that thirst with the word. You're trying to uh, heed to the call God calling you. Satan sees that. He said, now let me throw opportunities out here to keep them, distract them. And sadly, many fail. And 
then Daniel, as he walks into the Babylon, going to the king palace, look what they begin to do. Verse 5, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. In other words, the king won't, won't Daniel to have what he wants Daniel to have so he can get Daniel thinking to get in the line what he wants Daniel thinking to be. See, that's what school is doing. Huh? What do you think of all this school stuff doing? They're teaching you y'all about hate crime. Don't say nothing about homosexuality and all. Only thing they're doing is trying to program your mind to Babylon. They're doing it through school. They're doing it through music. They do it through movies. All of it is to get your mind set to be comfortable here in this world. And then get you into an anointing and say, let's just love everybody. Everything is okay. Nope. Nope. I love everybody, but I hate sin. Amen. But the devil want to get your mind set. Let's just get along together and be one big family. You become my family when you're born again. Then we are family. Hello? That's right. So the king had to give them things to get them to where he wants them to be. Change their thinking. Change their diet. Change their, get them a different appetite. See, this is what's going on through Facebook. Now, I know I talk about Facebook a lot. I'm not against it. I'm just against some of the things that they do on it. Yeah. But it's too much time put in that stuff. You know what? The prophet of God says this. If I go into your house and see what you got on your wall, what pictures you got on your wall, he said, I have a good idea what's about you. How many of you know you post things on Facebook that's a wall? <laughs> so you identify by the things you're posting on Facebook. Look and see what you're posting and get a good idea what's inside of your heart. That's right. So this world is designed to get your mind, control your mind, to get you away from the things of God. But here's the deceiving thing about it. The devil want to get you... The devil want to get you to think this way, but yet be religious. Go to church. Worship. Sing. Do whatever you want to do. Just don't get the Holy Ghost. That's right. That's exactly right. Whew. You know what? Go back to the book of Exodus and read the story when Pharaoh, go to the part where Pharaoh was making deals. How many of you know Pharaoh was making deals with Moses? <laughs> Other words, were telling Moses, let's make a deal. Moses wasn't interested in making no deal. The only thing Moses had in his mind, let my people go so we can go worship God. So what Pharaoh wanted to do, you remember, Moses said, we want to go a three-day journey. We want to go a three-day journey in the wilderness so we can worship our God. Not a one-day, not a two-day, but a three-day journey. That's what Moses wanted. But Pharaoh said, let's make a deal, Moses. Let's make a deal. He said, you, you go on. Worship God just like you said. But then he said, but don't go too far. Worship God in the land. Moses said, not so. We worship the God and the abomination of the Egyptians all around us. Moses said, no, no, no. See, that's a trick of the devil. He told Moses, go worship, but just don't go far. What was Pharaoh doing? He was telling Moses, I want you to go worship your God, but I don't want you to go too far because I might need to need something from you. I might need to use you. I want you to be available. That's the same thing with the devil. Don't go too far in God. I want you to keep your lust. I want you to keep your attitudes. I want you to keep these things. I might want to anoint you and use you sometimes. But you got to let the devil say, you got to let the devil know, no, I'm going farther than that. Yes, Pharaoh come back to him again. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. He's going ahead. But leave your cattle. No, he's leaving little ones. You, Moses, just like you said, you old ones go. Lead the little ones, pre-adventure. It's a lot of trouble out there, Moses. You don't want to take them down there now that there's a heat. Y'all just go on. 
He wanted the Moses and them to separate from the little one so that he can do it, uh, what Nebuchadnezzar is doing, get to their mind. But he said, I got to get rid of the old ones so I can get to the little ones so I can get them the way I want them. That's why he hates ministry. Satan hates old time preachers, old time ministers that believe in the original way. Satan hates them. Can we say amen? That's why the devil try to get you to pull back from your parents. Man, my parents don't understand what I'm going through. They old now. This is a new generation. Let me just pull back. Let me get some counsel from some of the young people that is around me. They don't understand us. Yes, we do understand you. I did not come out of my mama womb 54 years old. That's right. But he want to get you to pull away from elders. Someone that's going to give you wisdom and the right guidance. And Moses said, not so. He said, we will go with our little ones. Yeah. The old, we're all gone. Yeah. The Pharaoh said, okay, 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 okay. He said, go, leave your cattle. Just leave your cattle and you go. He tried to get Moses and them to go worship God without a sacrifice. That's what the devil wants us to try to get us to do. Be religious, but not having a revelation what this true sacrifice Jesus Christ is all about. And Moses said, nope, we're all going to go. Our old, our young, our cattle. And Moses was so greedy. He said, we ain't even going to leave a hoof. I can imagine Pharaoh, come on, dude. You got to have over four million cattle out there, and you're going to tell me you, you won't even leave a hoof. That's exactly right. Because Moses want the devil to know everything that belongs to God goes. And you have to have that same attitude. My mind belongs to God. My thinking belongs to God. My soul belongs to God. My spirit belongs to God. Satan ain't leaving nothing for you to use to try to anoint me to go the wrong way. I'm not giving it to you. I'm giving it all to God. Because it's a three-day journey, not one. Justification, sanctification, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You got to go all the way. Three-day journey. It's like, right. The tactics of the devil. That's how he does things. Notice. Verse 6. Now among these were of the children of Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That is their God-given name. But the devil don't like that. He said, I want to give him another name. See, the devil want to give you another name. <laughs> huh? He want to call you chicks and dudes and player and all those kind of names. Them Babylonian words. Huh? You take it to another level. He want to give up another name, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal. Then the name the devil want to give up, but God said you're Christians. You are sons and daughters of God. That's what you are. But the world want to give you names. Yeah, sometimes some young people, especially the down south, they get caught up in, in the message. They get caught up into some of these worldly atmosphere. They decide to change their name too, call them their name Swaggyo and all that stuff. Send in a message church, Swaggyo. That don't even sound right to me to call somebody Brother Swaggio. <laughs> what are they trying to do? They want a name to try to fit in with the, what the world, the trend of the world is doing. That's exactly right. Try to change their identity, changing, their, changing everything about them. They changed the Daniel's location, they changed Daniel's name, but they could not change Daniel's heart. Verse 7, but to whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Azariah Abednego. They think if they did good to say their mom and dad, and the mama would say, hey, Daniel, he's an arm Belteshazzar. She said, what? That ain't the name I gave you, boy. Where you get that from? That's what they called me. The devil want to change your complete identity. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Away from anything of this message. Yes. 
but be tied into this world, the worldly names. He want to change everything about you. Verse 8. This is the verse I love. But Daniel purposed. Not in his mind. See, when you purpose something in your mind, that can change. But when you get something rooted down in your heart, amen, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portions of the king's meat. He had to do that because he knew if I accept what the king gave me, it's going to change me. It's going to change the way I think, change the way I look. I don't want it. You got to be the same way, brothers and sisters. I don't want nothing that this world has to offer. Nothing. I want the mind of Christ, not the mind of this world. Not with the wine which he drank. What a, what a, what a position to be in. Drinking the same wine that the king drank. What an honor. I just want to let the world know I do drink wine, but not that one. I drank the wine of revelation or the stimulation of the word, not that one. Verse 9. Now, how, now, I want you to catch this, brothers and sisters. This boy is 14 years old. But look at the decisions he's making at the age of 14. He's making decisions adults want him to make. 14 years old. Because it was something down in here. He said, I'm not going to give this up. Purpose in his heart. Not only Daniel, the other three did it too. Let me explain something to you in a minute. I'm going to get to this verse. Let me just skip down. Let me skip some things here. I don't want to, but I'm going to have to for time's sake. So I'm wondering, I can be a long-winded preacher or I can be a short one. <laughs> my, wife, my wife gave me a compliment this morning. She said, that was too quick. <laughs> and she told me, she said, I knew you had some more fuel in that tank, brother. I said, that was too quick. She said, yeah, it was too quick. For a preacher to get that from his wife, that's good. Because <laughs> usually they be the one to remind you, that was a long winded I'm just saying. <laughs> Let me just, I'm going to jump down to verse 17. Let me, I'm going to have to go with my Bible. I ain't, I ain't marked down what I want, but let me read something to you. Go down here to verse, uh, verse 11. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the princes of the unit had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, prove thy servants. I beseech thee ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. And let our continents be looked upon before thee. And the continents of the children that eat of the portions of the king's meat and as thou seest, deal with thy servant. That's a bold statement. Yeah. Other words, Daniel let him know, you let us eat what we want to eat. And you the one, the other one, because the other, a lot of them children of Israel failed. Them four didn't. But the rest of them failed. He said, you let them eat that king's meat. And then when we come together, you, you look at our contents and we'll let you be the judge. Right. That's what I'm going to tell you something, young people. Yo, the way you say certain things, even the way you dress, the way you talk, it speaks on what you're eating. Because you're going to express it out. And I'm not talking about in church either. I'm talking about when you ain't in church. You know I love the Holy Ghost. This is just 20-something years ago. Even in the school systems, when parents, they know the parents love the Lord and have a testimony. When the children do wrong, the school tell on them. 
That's right. You know, sometimes young girl, they get their friend to sneak a pair of pants to school for and they put the pants on at school and all of a sudden, you get a phone call and the teacher say, now I know what you believe. I might not agree with what you believe. But your daughter had pants on. You kidding me? Yes. Then you come home always, hey, ma, how was your dad's school? Great. <laughs> I didn't know they got a phone call from school to tell on you. Them things happen. You know, another thing happened. You, you know, sometimes young people get out there on the jobs. It's working. But on the job, they want to they want to act like everybody else. They don't want to testify, I'm a Christian, I love the Lord. And they, they're ashamed. Jesus, don't be ashamed of me. You be ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you. But they be on the job acting all cool and everything. Don't want to get down with the normal language and stuff. And then one day they be with their parents, they just be walking somewhere. And then one of them guys on the job see you. They say, yo, what's up, homie? What's up, dog? You're like, what, what, what are you talking about? What, what, what are you saying? I don't know what they're saying, mom. No, they're telling on you. God permits that to happen. Do you know why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. To let you know, don't be ashamed of me. Don't get caught up. I know it's pressure. I know it's a pull on the flesh, but I got better things for you than that. That's exactly right. Verse 15. At the end of the 10 days, their conscience appeared fair and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. That's why we appear different because of what we're eating on. We're eating on the word. We appear different to the world. And I want to say this. It ain't just even the appearance of your clothes. But when you're eating on the word, feasting on the things of God, you carry an anointing that the world recognizes something different about you. It'll be an anointing that they recognize. Verse 16, the males all took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them poles. Now, I want you to catch verse 17. You know, before I read it, <laughs> I know the language. As young people, you want us to understand what you're going through. I understand every bit of that. I sympathize with that. I do. I actually do. Because it's such a poor. But I want to show you something that will help you even when you're down. You're like, it's just so hard. It's so rough. It's all this going on. See, it's just, it's just so, it's, I just can't. It's just an each. It's just so much going on. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm one of the wrong preachers to bring that to. Because that type of stuff, I can't pull my spirit down with you. Say, oh, bless your heart. God understands. Just keep pressing on. You know what you're going to do? You're going to walk away feeling justified. And yet be in the same state. Because I want to take you to something higher. Amen. To let you know regardless of what you're going through. Here's someone here to help you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I want you to watch the scripture. Because Daniel and them purposed in their heart. No wavering, no doubt. They was dead set. We're not going to defile ourselves. Whenever you make a decision like that in your life. I'm going to serve God regardless. Whenever you do that, God will send an anointing on your life and strengthen you to help you keep walking. Amen. See, we don't read what Daniel and them purpose in their heart. They, 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 they weren't going to defile themselves because of them doing that. Listen to what verse 17 says. As for these four, not men, children. God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom 
And Daniel had understanding and vision and dream. Because their purpose, their heart, God poured an anointing all upon them. He will do the exact same thing for you. See, I'm purpose. I'm going to serve God. God just start anointing you, giving you strength. Start overcoming things. you be like, wow, what, I just feel like I'm just going up now. It's because of what you purpose. That's how God does things. But now will you walk every day of your life with that strength? No. But he gives you portions when you're at your lowest stage, when you have need, because you keep pressing on, he still give drop portions like he did Ruth, handfuls of portion, purpose. Because if God anoint you every day of your life and you're up on the mountain, you'll freeze. How many of y'all heard Brother Branham say that? He said, you stay up on the mountain all the time, your fruit freeze. <laughs> That's why the mountains have valleys. How many of y'all ever seen a whole series of mountains just staring at them? Anybody ever been driving just seeing mountains? You know what you do? You just stare at the top of them. Ooh, wow, look at that mountain. You never pay no attention to the valley. It lets you know to get the one mountain to the next, you got to go down to the valley to get there, up and down. Up and down. But we sang this song, the God on the mountain, he's still God in the valley. God gave them this anointing because they purposed this in their heart. Can we say praise the Lord? I'm just trying to show you, but these are children in Babylon. One quote book. See, Daniel and the other three even though they was in Babylon, they was in different provinces. Daniel was by himself. The other three had fellowship with each other. But Daniel was by himself and overcame with one quote book. Now, Daniel could come overcome with one quote book from Jeremiah. How much you can do what God don't gave you in this day? Over 1,200 messages. You can overcome this layer of the sea and age. But you got to do the same thing that Daniel just had one book. He would read it over. 70 years reading one book. And he overcame Babylon. Now what about you and me with all God has poured out in this day? He give us this word, this message to overcome this age. Whew. Can we say praise the Lord? Turn to Daniel 3. See, some of you getting sleepy. I can give you some resurrection power. All I got to do is say I'm fishing the clothes. <laughs> you know the people resurrect. Mm -hmm. He fin the clothes. Mm -hmm. A few more minutes go by. He ain't closing. <laughs> Daniel chapter 3. You remember the same cry in Daniel chapter 3 to come to worship an image. It's the same thing that's happening today. We want us to fall down to the image of the beast, worship the beast. All these things parallels right in the scripture. How many of you believe that? The mark of the beast and all these things, you can preach it right here in the scripture. But I think something that's overlooked in this age about pulling people to the image. And one of the key things in this day where the devil have really mastered is music. According to science, music is the only thing can invade your conscience without your permission. According to science, you say, oh, no, no. well, let me give you an example. How is it you just can be in a department store minding your business? Ain't thinking about no music, but you just walk in the department store and all of a sudden. And then you catch yourself, ooh, whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry, Lord. <laughs> Sorry. The music can invade your conscience just like that. How many of you ever been sitting in a restaurant waiting on your food to come and music playing and then all of a sudden you get the knife or the fork you start going. 
That music has invaded your country. Then when you catch it, whew, hope nobody didn't see that. <laughs> That's the power of music. Power of music. And then the prophet of God has a vision of the end time, of the worldly bride, God's bride. In both incidents, music was involved. One of them was dancing to a rock and roll tune, and the other one was marching on with Christian soldier. Music is involved. Now watch Daniel 3, verse 4. Then a herald came aloud. To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. Not just Babylon, because this is the time of the Gentile reign. They had power over everything. Verse 5, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, plastering, decimal, listen to what it said, and all kinds of music. You fall down and worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. All kinds of music. Hitler says this, you give me the music of a country, I control the youth of the country. Because he know it works through music. That's why you, me, we have to be careful with music. If you're listening to music and it's, and it's not ministering to your soul, that is not of God. If it just make you happy in your flesh, this is what it is, fleshly music. Music is ordained to minister to your soul and pull you closer to Jesus Christ. But the devil is so crafty. I hate to do this. How many of y'all ever heard of Kirk Franklin? Don't be ashamed. You have just raise your hand. Hang on. Some of you know, uh, ain't gonna do that. You probably sang some of his songs and don't even know it. Kirk Franklin is one of the greatest tools the devil has in this day and time. Kirk Franklin. I used to be a disc jockey professional. I can take Kirk Franklin music and I can show you every worldly song that we danced in the club where he got it from. And he don't even change much to it. Only thing he added is the words of God. He said, but he's talking about Jesus. No, 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 no. Where did that music come from? Where did the root of that music come from? That's right. I had to prove that. Well, I got prove it. I got my son one time. I said, let me share something to you. Pull up a Kurt Franklin song, I'll go find the worldly song. I said, what's the difference? Well, ain't no different. And they give him praise. Kurt Franklin has revolutionized the way that music is. He sure did. Under what anointing? The devil. What, what celebrities today, people will listen to them more than a president and than a preacher. What's happening now, they got celebrities when they make new audio Bibles. They get the voice of celebrities to read the Bible. Morgan Freeman, his voice is so distinct. They want him to read the Bible to you. And this man don't even believe in God. All of this is a part of Babylon feeding you her meat, getting your mind directed the way that she wants it. All of this is happening all around us every day. Children in Babylon. I'm going to close. <laughs> I'm saying this from the depths of my soul. Showing you how Daniel overcame 
all of those years and he didn't have the Holy Ghost. Now what excuse we have having the Holy Ghost but yet letting Babylon control us. It's no excuse. I understand your struggles. I understand your pressure. I understand. But I'm here to tell you, you need to look a different way. Because if you want to stay in a sad situation where I'm just struggling, I'm just struggling, I'm just struggling, I'm just struggling, you'll stay that way, and the only thing in your life is going to be the struggle, you'll never get nowhere. You'll stay stuck in one spot. You have to come to a place, I'm tired of the struggle. I'm going to be free from this struggle. See, you go through changes in life as a young person. You go through them stages, you condemn yourself in the mirror. You look in the mirror. Why can't my hair be like hers? Look at this. Before you know it, you get a young girl in the church that seemed to be popular. All you got to do is watch her hairstyle. If she got any little followers, they'll do her hair, their hair just like hers. They don't not form the hair club. <laughs> Boys, get in the mirror. Man. Why can't I be like him? Only thing you're doing is trying to find an identity in your life, but you're looking at the influence from somebody else want to be like them. You don't need muscles to serve Jesus. You need faith muscles. Beauty is being born again. Every girl that is born again full of the Holy Ghost, you are beautiful. You ain't got to try to attract nobody from the outward appearance. You can, it, it's the Holy Ghost. If a boy got the Holy Ghost, you got the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost attracts Holy Ghost. I am so hurt of you hearing so many divorces happen around this perfect word amongst young people. Not even young, older. Something went wrong somewhere. Second right. How many of you want to be married? Go ahead, raise your hand. <laughs> How many of you want to get married? Now, the ones that didn't raise your hand, you'll get married first. <laughs> it happened to you first. See, when some of you raise your hand, the other one looked around. Mm, who's available? <laughs> Let me explain something to you. Coming to meetings like this, having meetings like this, there is nothing wrong when you know you're in a place with God, have the Holy Spirit. There's nothing wrong thinking maybe the one is here. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You see, down through the years, preachers preach it so hard. And you're coming here because you want a girlfriend, want a boyfriend, you are wrong. I don't know. I'd rather for you to be in a meeting like this and your heart right looking. Instead of looking the wrong way out there in that world. You might get a call on this one, Paul, but I'll stand behind what I said. I got no problem with that. I like to just keep it real because this gospel is real. It's real. But you got to make sure 100% you got that relationship with Jesus Christ. Children and Babylon. And I can see children in the Laodicea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm here to tell you, you can do the same thing Daniel did. Yes. Amen. Right. Yes. I'm going to tell you, young people, too, watch who you hang around. Just because you're in the same church, that don't mean they're good for you. Right. Ooh. Right. Come on. <laughs> exactly right. You need to be around somebody that's going to speak positive. It's going to talk about the things of God, not secret stuff, but things of God. 
That's what you need to hang, hang around. I remember back in the days, I don't preach so many count meetings. It ain't funny. I, I can't tell you how many. But I'm, a, I'm an observer. Back in the days, I'd be in the ministerial building, you know, where they keep the ministers, and I'd be looking out the window. And you can see certain boys walking around the campground. They know they're the man. They walk around with so much confidence. And when you talk to them, uh, you just look up there, you're looking at them. They know I'm it. And they got a, and I always have little fellows behind them, falling right behind them. <laughs> and they just walking around. And then when they get close to where the girls sit, you always have a girl in a group, she's it. And there'd be a bunch of little girls behind her. You'll notice it probably about the second day after the camp, because they'll have their hair kind of the same way. Because it's an influence. Want to fit in with a group and be identified. That's what that actually is. I preached at a camp. I said, you boys, I said, you walk around like you're the rooster. And all of the hands just flock. I said, I just want y'all to know one thing. I am the farmer with the pick fork. Because I hate to see a boy that thinks he's all of that play with a girl's emotion. And she gets so caught up. <laughs> he looked at me. Yeah, he looked at you, your friend, your friend, friend. He looked at all of you. That's right. A Holy Ghost gentleman don't do that. Don't do that. Walk around the campground, can't even get nothing out of the service because they. <laughs> what the preach preach? Oh, it was good. What did he say? It was good. <laughs> but all you did is sat there. And then when it's over, go into the cafeteria to eat. Make sure they get close. Get a little trick. I just observe, Brother Paul. I, I do. And it hurts my heart when I see young people get so vulnerable to want to fit in until they want to lower their self, lower their conviction just to fit in with a group. That hurts. One more. I had a young boy come to me one time. His dad come to me and said, Brother Bertie, could you talk to my son? He said, he has a lot of respect for you. I said, yeah, I talked to him once. Where is he at? He showed me where he's at. I went down there, and when I walked up to him, I seen him. He had his head down. He'll look up, see me coming. I just shook my head. I said, oh, that's a poor fella. I said, what's the problem, bud? So, Brother Burley, I try to hang around those guys that don't want me to be around. I said, really? I said, yeah. Yeah. I said, hmm. And the Holy Spirit comes on the scene. I said, have you ever had a little kid younger than you come up to you and want to play with you? Then you be with your other friends and you push the kid off. His continent changed. Like, where is the man going? I said, when that happened to you, you playing with a kid younger than you, your friends come around, you need to tell that young kid, say, hey, buddy, we're buddies. But let me get back with you later. I'm going to hang with them a little bit. I'll get back with you. I said, that little kid to go, okay, okay. I said, you didn't offend me. I said, but if you push him off and jump with your friends, I said, that's going to hurt him and it's going to offend him. I said, now you're reaping what you sowed. I said, your, your other problem is, I said, there's over 500 kids out here. 
on this campground. I said, but you want to fit with a certain group. I said, that's what you want. I said, well, you ought to go make friends with everybody. I said, if you make friends with everybody, you'll never be by yourself. I said, that's what you need to do. I didn't go up there. <laughs> I'm so sorry for you, young man. I, oh, God, no. That ain't going to help him. So he walks off. A couple hours later, I seen him. He made him a new group of friends. They was all laughing. I walked by. He, I, I looked at him. He looked at me. I said, <laughs> See, when you want to get in certain groups, it, you are got a denomination spirit on you. That's what you got on you. Right. When we're supposed to be the family of God. Right. Exactly right. The most wonderful thing when you see young people get converted, true experience in their life, you're able to reach younger people than more than me and Paul and them can. It just circles around and around. When you can see somebody struggling, go help them. Because they don't fit in your group. Uh, no, no. We all supposed to be the body of Christ. Sometimes a young boy might, might be noticeable. Because he might got some big glasses on. And girls look down. And <laughs> then later on in his life, he might become the CEO of a company. And then you find out, hey, but what about when he was that little bit nerdy little fella and you pay no attention to him? Now, hey, and he say, how you doing? Let me let you meet my wife. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's exactly right. Let me tell you something. Get married to Jesus Christ before you try to marry somebody else. Have a relationship with him first. He will bring the one that he ordained for you. Somehow, some way, he'll bring it together. But you have to be patient. And first, be right with him. That's how God does things. And I'm going to say this, and I promise I'll... I just said I promise. I didn't say I was going to do it. I just said I promise. <laughs> Let me say something to you. Out of all your faults, failures, errors, upset, disappointments, I want to let you know from the depths of my heart, just for you to even be here, I'm proud of you. May God bless you just for you to even be here. May God bless you. And don't take nothing lightly what I said to you this evening because I'm giving you exactly what God put on my heart. Many things I could preach, but this is what he put on my heart. I want to let you know, I don't care how young you are, you can overcome anything. Talk to your parents. If you don't have parents, you have a pastor. You have deacons. Someone you can talk to. Because it's a shame sometimes parents are not in the position where they need to be. That's bad. But I want to let you know you're always going to have somebody that can, you can have confidence in and talk to about situations in life. I pray to God it's your parents because that's the way it's supposed to be. But you do have pastors to lead you and guide you. Let me tell you something, young people. I believe Questions be asked sometimes, what is a successful pastor? I thought about that thing over and over and over. To me, a pastor's success is when he teaches the word of God, as God give it to him, so anointed and just lay it out to you and you receive it. A pastor's success is when you don't have to keep coming to him with your problem, but you can take the word of God and fix your problem. He's done his job. I'm not a Dr. Phil. 
got a problem. Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil, get a pill. No, 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 that's psychology. But when your pastor counsels you, when you hear the word of God preached, take it to your heart. Because something can come up in your life and then the Holy Spirit take you back. Hey, the pastor's preaching, another minister preached the same thing. You'll be able to deal with your problem. I love it when my congregation don't hardly ever come to me about their problem. That lets me know they caught a hope to the word. They can deal with it themselves. I don't want no married couple coming to me with a problem and we don't talk about it before. That makes me upset. Because that lets me know they didn't listen to me the first time. Now what makes you think they're going to listen the second time? Brother, take the word. You young man, I challenge you. Because you're going to be a leader of a family one day. You're going to be the priest of your home one day. But I'm challenging you to get into maturity. Mature in the word because you'll be a leader of a home one day. And it's pressure. Some just want to get married. I just want to get married. It's okay. It ain't what you think it is. Love is blind. Marriage is eye-opening. You learn a lot of things. But if you can take things now while you're young and apply it to your life, it's going to help you in your, when you get married, all these things are going to help you. You'll be able to glean on them, pull back on them, think about them. And it, it is going to help you. But it's still going to be mistakes because you got to grow. People don't even believe in courtship no more. They believe in, let's do it. Ta-da! Nope. It don't work like that. And I'm going to tell you, young boy, if you ever talking to a young girl without the consent of her father, I'm ashamed of you. I'm ashamed of you. That's wrong. That's what worldly, that's what Babylonians do. Not believers. You see, another thing mess up the young people is this texting. I don't believe you got no right to be texting a girl. It's the parents, the father don't know. Because when you're texting, you, you're creating a bond and a relationship. She's taking your words. Ooh, you're creating something. That ain't right. It's not right. When you got your life right with God, you won't be ashamed to approach a man. You say, sir, I'd like to talk to you. I've been praying for a wife. I'm kind of interested in your daughter. Can I talk to you, sir? If he's a mature man, it's all right, son, let's get together and talk. But if he knows his daughter, he says, young man, I appreciate you coming to me, but she ain't ready for this kind of stuff. You need to be a gentleman and walk away. And leave it alone. Don't be, but sir, God showed me she's lying. He might tell you, son, God showed me something right now. I think you might need to leave. <laughs> and some girls get so offended because sometimes their dad might be a little rough. I never get nobody with a daddy like this. You ought to be thankful to your daddy like that. But there are some incident, parents are too rough and they run off a good man, run off a good girl. That's why the balance has to be by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can we say amen? amen. One young girl, I'm just talking now, musicians can come. <laughs> One young girl had a boy come up to her. He said, God showed me you as my wife. She said, well, only thing missing, God just need to show you, me, you're my husband. And he ain't showed me that. She just walked away. <laughs> it's because the person put God in it. I mean, people are like, ooh, ooh, it's a spirit of person. I better listen to it. No, God got to show you something too. God can speak to you too. But young man, 
If you know you ain't even right yourself, struggling, ain't overcoming things, don't try to get in a relationship. Don't do it. Because if you do, then you still got them problems, ain't been overcame, your useful lust, no overcome, you ain't overcome them things, you keep going and going and Oh, we're going to get married. Then you do get married. You know what happens? You carry all of that right into that marriage. Now you're in a marriage, not only struggling with things that happen in a marriage, now you're struggling with yourself, trying to overcome things you should have overcame before you got into marriage. It's true. Be a gentleman. Be a gentleman. Amen. You can have a healthy marriage, healthy relationship. If you just listen to the teachings of the word and don't get impatient. Because you got a lot of vultures out here. You, let me tell you young girl something that might offend you a little bit. But it's going to be the truth. Just because you're in the atmosphere around the message of the hour. It gives you a certain reflection. Because you're under that anointing. Yes, These worldly boys know that yes, when they see you. To you, they look at you as an innocent little church girl that I can easily get to. Just the way they view you. Just because of the anointing. So when they come up on you and talk these words that tingle into your ear, if they can't go the right way, like I taught you about your pastor, your dad, and so forth, you better stay away from that boy. And, and let me tell you something. He's going to keep talking till he can break your, he can break your armor with words. And you'll be like, oh, he's just joking. He's just, he just funny. No, he's he working on something. He just throw a little word at a time. They slip. You look so cute today. That's all he got to say. He ain't got to say nothing now. Wait a couple days. Now they're stuck in your head. He said, I was cute. He'll just take his time. Come back near the house. You see. Because now he's working with your emotions. You're getting attention. Now you're letting down your arm. So he comes to say, you look cute today. My dad think I am too. He goes, oh, 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 I was just kidding. No, you wasn't. <laughs> you got to know how to put up a block. When your ears, you're you wanting, your ears, your ears just go, woo, woo, say more, say more, say more. You say that don't happen in this mess? Yes, it does. And it's wrong. Remember this young girl, if he can bypass your parents or authority to talk to you, he is no good. He's no good. He has no respect for ministry, no respect for order. He is no good. I don't care how cute he is. He's no good. Even if a girl do the same thing, girls do it too. They're just aggressive as boys are. Brother, she's no good. How many of you know it's contrary to scripture for a girl to go run off of a man? Who brought Adam his wife? God did. <laughs> brought, him, brought her right to him. There's two women in the Bible looked at for a man and their character wasn't right. It was Jezebel. Jehu. It was Potiphar's wife. Joseph. Neither one of them right. Sister, you'll find your husband on your knees. God will bring it together. Can we say praise the Lord? These things are serious. Don't take it lightly. Don't ruin your life. Prophet God said you make the wrong decision, you can ruin your life forever. 
Don't make the wrong decision. Pray. Seek God. Talk to your parents. Talk to your pastor. Can we say amen? amen. One more, Brother Paul. This is true. I had a young girl in my church. She went through some hard things in life and got to a place who would ever want me? Made a lot of mistakes. Then all of a sudden, a guy pops up interested in her. She's like, Ooh. you know, somebody interested in me? Okay. Then they come to me. Parents come to me. I said, yeah. I said, well, this brother is interested in our, our daughter. We want to let you know uh, what's going on. Okay. I said, well, where are you from? He told me where he's from. Who are your pastor? He told me his pastor. Said, okay. I know the pastor. He's a good guy. Okay. I'll get back with you. So I called the pastor. <laughs> I'm an investigator. <laughs> that ain't just good enough because I know who your pastor is. Your pastor going to know who you is. So I called the pastor. I said, hey, it's a brother go to your church. So I said, yeah, brother, brother. He's a, he's a good guy. He's always in service. and Good guy. I'm like, I said, okay. 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 Went back to the parents. I said, ah, the pastor said he's a pretty good old guy. And uh, he's a good brother, good in the word. Then my deacon began to talk to the one. The brother come down and visit. The deacon would talk to him. He said, are you a citizen here? Are you on a work visa, student visa? He said, student visa. Red flag went up. Red flag. So a few days pass, I get a phone call from the pastor. He said, Brother Berlin, I did a little more checking. He said, that boy has a wife in London. In the message. He said, thank you, I'll take care of it. So we had a little fellowship at the house, and I seen the sister. My heart just killing me, cause knowing what she'd been through, and now somebody interested, it's, it's, it's killing me. So I just walked up to her. How you doing? She said, fine. I said, you think about this guy. She said, he, he, he's okay. Okay. I said, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah. I said, what if he just cuts it off with you? Just tell you it ain't gonna work. She said, brother Bird, let me be honest with you, it won't bother me. She said, because. He told me he loved me the other day, and he wanted me to say it back. She said, I can't say that back. I don't know him that good yet. But I, I got muscles. I said, he's mine. <laughs> I said, is he coming to church tomorrow? She said, yeah, he's he, he going to go back. He can't stay for service. No, no, no. If you just tell him come Sunday morning, he ain't got to stay to the service. I just need to talk. That's all. That's all I need to do. She said, okay. So he comes in my office. How you doing, buddy? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. It's all right. I said, what do you, what you think about this sister? He said, oh, she's a lovely sister. Very lovely. I said, you know she's been through a lot of things in life. He said, yeah. He said, the parents told me things that happened, what went on with her. I said, did you appreciate them telling you that? He said, oh, yeah, most definitely. I said, why you couldn't return the same favor? He said, what do you mean? I said, about that wife you got there in London. He said, oh, oh, oh. I said, oh, don't speak in tongue now. <laughs> You've been exposed, buddy. I, 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 no, don't give me none of your reasoning. He said, but the diary that we have, no, we talk about message, brother. We ain't talking about no traditions. Message. He said, brother, you're wrong. I said, you hold on right here. I said, go get your daughter. Daughter coming out of the kitchen. I said, this man got something he need to tell to you. He said, oh, no, 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 no. ain't no need to cry. Just tell him what you've done. And she just said, I hit the road, Jack. Now there's an old worldly song called Hit the Road, Jack, and don't you come back here no more. And he hit the road. That's protecting her. Now she's married, got a lovely family because she waited on God. We as ministers, true pastor, will do things like that. Because they're looking out for your soul. Yes. That's why you work together. Pastor, work together with your parents. We work together to make sure my daughter, my son, going to be safe. Ain't nothing getting messed up.
you ought to thank God for that. Instead of having one of these pastors, oh, look like a good guy to me. Marry him. Get her. When, when, when you want to set the date, that's not a good pastor. He just wants membership. Huh? But you ought to be thankful for that. Am I boring y'all? Are you sleeping? You get sleepy, just stand up, shake it off. But I'm done. Let's give the Lord a hand. I forgot to ask, does anybody need prayer? The servant will pray with you. Let me explain something to you. Some meetings, every meeting is not the same. Sometimes you have youth meetings. People need deliverance. Power of God come down. There'd be an altar call. There's nothing wrong with that. But there are some meetings you got to let stuff sink. Get you to think about things. Contact down in that soul. But I do would like to offer prayer if someone needs prayer. If you got something that's bound in you, need deliverance, I'm actually going to talk to you how to be delivered. It's all Christ. You can overcome anything. It's all right for a preacher to lay hands on you, pray with you. But we all got to come to a place in life where you can grab hold Amen. to things yourself and handle it by the word of God. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, and that's what I'm presenting to you, that you can overcome anything right. with him. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand together. Praise the Lord. Young people, God has so many protections in place in the word of God for your life. He loves you and he not only has them in the word but he has a minister who will be honest and say those things to you. And we believe the same way, Brother Berlin and I, in these principles and boundaries and just things that build respect. And uh, we got a couple here, they got two children, that's the two kids that sang tonight, Lane and Kylie. But uh, Lindsay, was, I so told this story a few weeks ago but talking about a girl watching out for herself. She was at high school and Kyle got his eye on Lindsay and he's just in the world, a worldly guy, you know, but he's like Brother Birdie said, one of those got his eyes on that girl, you know. And so she, he came and said he wanted, he asked her out and she said, no, 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 we, we don't do that. We don't do that. But you can come to church with me if you want. I love that. I love that story because there's a girl who's got some strength about her, not just to give in to the wooing of a man because he says you're pretty or says these things. And these things are text back and forth all the time. Be careful your words. If you can't back them up with a commitment, you don't, shouldn't loosely say things like I love you and things like that that bond. Save it. Save it for when you know it's the right one. She said, you can come to church. And so he said, all right. Came to church, and saved, repented, saved baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost and his family serving the Lord. Praise God. God will honor you. Amen. You know, every situation is different. Every love story is different. There's no cookie cutter thing that takes place. We know everything, every relationship will be different, but God's boundaries don't change. And the reason he talks about a boy going to the father is because it builds respect. If you're going around the other way, if at all possible, you should talk to that man because that man's the protection over that daughter's life. You can find it in the Old Testament. He has power to even break a vow of a girl, the daddy does, because God gave him that authority to watch over that girl. You say, well, what do I have to do that for? All I'm telling you, and Brother Burley's saying to you tonight so capably, don't buy into the Babylonian ways of how to do things. Do it according to the Word of God, and God will bless your future family and you're one that you fall in love with. He'll bless it more if you abide by God's principles in his way. You know, I'd love to, I can't wait someday to talk to Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Mendigo. Someday, soon, I'm going to be sitting down with them and they can tell me the whole story. I said, praise the Lord, brother. My, how did you do it? Rid, living smack dab in the middle of Babylon by yourself in the kings. I said, I said, God bless you, bro. 
God bless you. Let me give you a hug for not eating, the purposing in your heart not to eat the king's meat. But you know, some of you are with me and give a hug to Daniel. Some of you young brothers and sisters give a handshake. God bless you, Daniel. We heard about you just a few months ago or last year we heard about you. Brother Burley spoke about you again in Daniel. God bless you for your stand that you made. And he might ask you young girl, your young guy, what age did you come out of? What time did you come out of? You say, well, we lived in the last age in Laodicea. We lived in Satan's Eden that was called by the prophet. Your Jeremiah called it Babylon. Our prophet called it Satan's Eden, and we lived right in the middle of it. And Daniel's eyes perk up. And he wants to give your hand a handshake and say, God bless you. We did everything we could to purpose in our heart to overcome Babylon. But you lived in Satan's Eden and you overcame. You didn't keep struggling with things. There's a difference in struggling and overcoming. People say, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. You know, it's a different. You, got, you want to start saying, I'm overcoming, I'm not struggling anymore. We are overcomers. Can you say amen? And my sister has that song, Are You She? Because one day they'll look at you and say, Are you she, the bride of the last days, who stood the worst of times? I'm looking at young people tonight are going to not just survive, but they're going to overcome Laodicea in this hour. I'm looking at you tonight. I'm looking at that bride. Amen. Brother Burley spoke to those people that will be on the other side, those young people, saying, By the grace of God, we made it through. I'm just a privilege to know you tonight and just be able to be here with you. One thought that I had is when Daniel purposed in his heart, that day he made a decision. And his friends, Brother Bram said him and his friends would get together and have Bible studies and encourage one another. You should do that. They got together and encouraged one another, one another in Babylon. That, I was thinking tonight, when he made that decision, just a little decision, I'm not going to eat king's meat. Do you know that that was the beginnings of Jeremiah's prophecy of redemption being fulfilled? The spoken word book said Jeremiah said in 70 years I'm going to bring you out of captivity. I'm going to redeem you back. You know what the start of it was? Somebody who made a decision. I am not going to defile myself with this world. Why did he make that? Because there's a revelation saying that's how we got in this mess. That's how we got in Babylon. That's how we're, that's why we're in captivity now and we're away from our parents. And this is how all this happened because people got away from the word of God. So what I need to do is make a little decision right now. No, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't want your wine. I don't want your meat. I don't want your pornography. I don't want to be, a, I don't want my name changed to a gamer. I don't want that identity. I'm purposing my heart. And that little decision began the process of redemption being fulfilled. You don't realize how powerful your decisions are. Make a little decision towards God and all of heaven is backing you up. And that's what he said. I have decided to follow Jesus. Yes, I 